Hi guys. Hey Doc. So nothing's going on, right? <laughs> so we opened up the uh, station in South Fulton uh, this morning. Uh, the first thing that happened, we got it clean, and then I went with the chiefs and we did an inspection of the station to make sure it was clean. Uh, the three uh, firefighters from that station are doing well, as is the Grady paramedics that took care of the patient from over there. So that's been the first one in the South Metro area. If you haven't heard, I understand this afternoon we had our first death, or today they announced the first death in Georgia. And it was in Cobb County from COVID. Okay? Uh, I, I can't put slides together that move as fast as this is moving now. The news cycle is about every 12 hours. There's, there's an update on what's going on. We have very basic information on, on this new virus. Um, it comes from experience across the, the oceans, uh, but more experience coming from this country. And my 11 o'clock conference call today was the International Association of Fire Chiefs, including the Seattle and California groups, who are a couple weeks ahead of us. Fair enough? Okay. This uh, coronavirus, I, I have really visual things to give you here. Um, the coronavirus has been around for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. It is a puny little virus that likes to cause minor illnesses in human beings and, and not have them have bad outcomes because uh, then it could spread itself further. Fair enough? This is like your investments. Some of you want to invest very quickly and get a big return and then, and then have the thing killed. That's kind of like Ebola and other diseases that cause a very rapid disease and kill the person. And other investments that you have, uh, they, they go up really slowly and you want them just to do this. If you want to think about it that way, that's what the coronavirus wants. It doesn't want to make people very sick and it wants you to, to be alive to spread it to other people. Fair enough? Kind of a visual for you. The coronavirus has three times um, given humans problems. 2003 SARS, about 2007 was MERS, and then this bug. Uh, this bug is uh, from China, somewhere in the animal and bat kingdom. Won't really make any difference. It's spread out of there, and they can almost trace it person by person from there. Uh, we won't have full tracing done in this country for very, very long uh, because it's spreading so rapidly, but the early, the early case in this country all went with individuals who had traveled. The Seattle case is now even in that Kirkland nursing home, uh, came from the single patient that came into Seattle from Wuhan. Okay? And, uh, and so our science is now based very much on China <coughs> and then what has happened early on in this country. Okay, good news, good news. Uh, under age 10, across the globe, zero deaths. Zero deaths under age 10. Thank you guys, be safe. Under age 10, no deaths. Between age 10 and 20, almost no deaths. Um, and, uh, and then in 20... This has been my effect on you guys recently, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anything but a wheel chalk. Okay, under age 20, almost no deaths. And no deaths in under age 20 that didn't have a number of problem. Age 20 to 40, very little. The, the number's somewhere around two in a thousand. Many of you are in that age group. Over age 40, a little worse. Over age 60, a little worse. Over age 80, a lot worse. Okay, so this is an older person's disease hasn't been a disease of uh, pregnant women, okay? So it's just different than our other ones. Our other diseases were, uh, were uh, more dangerous in different ways. This one is a disease that seems to be dangerous uh, to the older population and to people who have underlying medical problems, which 
particularly lung disease. In China, a lot of people smoke. In China, many more men smoke than women. And so when you read China, it says men are more at risk, and that is because men have terrible lungs as they get older in China, because they smoke and have all the pollution. All right, so that's some of the basics of the bug. But do you understand that? We do not know if this bug is going to go 12 weeks in, in, in the, the 12 week course that's typical for viruses and burn itself out, or whether it could get bad, get a little better, and then get worse, as H1N1 did about 10 years ago. There's no science to any of it, it's somebody's guesses. And you will see, you will see posted somewhere um, that there could be millions of people exposed, and that, and that is true, okay? If you've been exposed once to this bug, you will not get it again. It's been very rare to have two infections at the same time, so that it's not that you get COVID and you get the flu, or and you get bacterial pneumonia or something like that, all right? So that's, that's the basic science of the bug. Are you okay with that so far? So let's talk about how you get sick. Can I go up to the board, mm -hmm. John? Yeah, absolutely. All right, <clears throat> so they've been able to watch people go through the disease cycle, okay? So if you will, day zero is when somebody exposes them. Typically they're exposed by somebody coughing at them, sneezing at them, or them somehow transferring from the patient who is sick to their mouth and nose, okay? And exposure, and then for about five days, about five days, four to five days, is they are asymptomatic. <laughs> and then when they get sick, they get a little sick. And so if you wanted to draw a curve, you would say, not sick, not sick, not sick, and about day five, they start to get a little bit sick. And the little bit of sick is runny nose, dry cough, sore throat, maybe runny eyes. Not high temperatures, not shaking chills, none of the big symptoms, okay? If I was to tell you about flu, what would you say about flu? Day zero, you get exposed, typically by somebody coughing, sneezing, touching you, and you putting it in you. Typically, you go two or three days, and you get pretty sick right away. Pretty much, you guys know, when you, when you get the flu, it's a period of a couple hours, and you're feeling like shit. I'm sorry. You're feeling bad. And, and you spike a temp, and you don't feel very good. So it's very different in terms of how it presents. Uh, in the flu, typically you get sick pretty quick and then you get better, unless you have underlying medical problems or it does something else to you. And so that's kind of the course of the flu. So here we are, we go along about, age, about day five, and about day five is when you become infectious to other people. So you can be cruising along here, not knowing that you have this bug, and about day five, you build up enough of the bug in your cells that they can begin to be spread to other people and you begin to have symptoms. Make sense? There's been a lot of people who had so few symptoms they didn't even know they had the disease. And when somebody swabbed them, uh, they, they said, you had the disease. Well, I, I'm fine, you know. Or this time of the year, what are they going to say? Sinuses. I got my allergies and sinuses and that kind of stuff. Because that's what it sounds like. If I was just to give you this symptom complex, you say, you know, it's April in Atlanta. You've got allergy problems. So do you understand why this disease has been spreading? And I, I take it for you guys, this is, this is like a fire. And the fire starts in this room and we put the fire out. And in, in many buildings that we go into, then you take a tick and you say, I know exactly where that fire could have gone and, I, and, and it's done. You know, I tick this and it's done. And you guys have been in other buildings like I have where uh, there was, there was, it popped <laughs> somewhere else. It got into a chase here, it got into something, and you're like constantly behind this thing spread through the building because you just can't get ahead of it. That's kind of what we're doing in this country right now. We think we had it, quote, contained, and then it pops up somewhere else and it pops up somewhere else. Right now, all of our pop-up cases have been from travel. And to this point, travel has been the indicator that people were, could be sick, and particularly travel on a cruise ship, okay? So, five days, you start to get sick, you start to get infectious. Many people are gonna get better, and they're gonna be back on their feet, and we think around day 10, 12, 14, is when you stop shedding virus. 
That's why 14 day quarantine periods. Okay, so that even if you got a little of the sickness, you stayed at home and didn't spread it to anybody else. All right? There's other people, particularly those with diseases, that getting out here about eight, nine, ten days from exposure, then they start to get really sick. Okay? And that's when um, they develop respiratory distress syndrome, they develop pneumonia, they die. Okay? It, for some reason, goes from being a bug up here and it drops into their lungs. Your lungs typically are well protected, and this virus, over all of its hundreds of years, hasn't done well against lung defenses and hasn't caused people to die. Therefore, never a need for a vaccination for any of the coronaviruses, and no money ever about, about coronavirus vaccination. There's plenty of other diseases that we need vaccinations for, and it costs billions of dollars and lots of time to, to create vaccines, just so everybody understands that. Out here is where we potentially, over the next month, will be seeing patients, unfortunately. All right? So here's the story. They got sick. They got exposed. They got sick. They get seen by somebody, and as soon as we have enough tests, some of them will be getting tested. Tested means a swab in the nose, another swab in the throat, and a swab that contains something that they cough up. Okay? So right now, each patient gets three specimens, or two to three specimens. They test those, and they say, you've got the virus, or you don't have the virus. Right now, those tests are in such short supply that we have been testing very few people. That's why we don't know a whole lot about this bug. China essentially ran out of tests, and that's why their numbers have gone down, because they're not testing anymore because they don't have tests. Okay? So the testing out here may be positive if we get more of these tests and we're starting to swab people. And potentially they would say, you look good, <laughs> go home. You got the bug, stay, stay in for 10 more days so that you're not giving it to other people. And if you get short of breath or, or begin to feel really bad, that would be the time to seek medical care. And there will be a lot of people like her sent home that will do just fine. But there's a certain number, and right now that number is somewhere between 15% and 5% that are going to get sicker. And that's when we may get a call. And that's when we hope our dispatcher will say, you're going on a COVID patient who's 10 days into their illness and they're short of breath. In which case, we need to be prepared to deal with that patient. Everybody okay with that? A lot of patients hopefully will be going home and we will never hear from them. They'll get better on their own in about 14 days, you know, 17 days, somewhere in there, they'll, they'll be out and we'll never know about it. Okay? By the way, we have no blood tests for this right now either. All right? So let's get very quickly to what we need to do for patients. Right now, travel history isn't much help. Right now, all you could ask, do you know that you have the disease or been around anybody that you know has the disease? Maybe that will be a help. The patients that are coming around in Atlanta right now don't necessarily have the classic symptoms, okay? And it's a problem. What do we need to protect you? I don't have my, I don't have my props with me. What's the most important thing? Mask. Mask. And if you only have one mask, where do you protect yourself best by putting that mask on the patient? On the patient. So that just so you know, big number one, this is spread from the nose and the throat. If you put a mask on the patient, they they have a tendency to shed a ton less of the virus. Okay, and it very much protects you more than you trying to put on an N100, a canister, self-contained, whatever you want to put on. Okay there's still a potential you get it. It's much more effective to put the mask on. For some reason, we have locked on to um, goggles. Somebody believes that this is, when the virus is shed, it can go into your eyes, and I want you all to appreciate, your eyes have glands up here that produce your tears. Your tears wash down this way to your eyes and go to ducts, pipes here, that empty into your nose. Somebody believes that if you goggle up and protect uh, that spray from getting in your eyes, uh, that you have less risk of that, that virus getting in your nose and you getting the disease. So goggles are an important part of this. Get some nice goggles, 
all right? Goggles, mask on the patient, mask on you, gloves. Mask on you for high risk is an N95. For low risk, it can be a surgical mask. N95s are protective, but they're hard to breathe through. N95s used to be one use. As of last week, they're now multiple use, and they're very much in short supply. And any new supplies have to come from? China. China, and we're not getting them, okay? So the CDC and others have written standards that say we can reuse our masks. I'm sorry, I am gross and you are gross. When you breathe into an N95 for a while, it has your bugs in it, and you don't want to give them to anybody else, and I don't want you to have mine. They also, if you leave them closed up, if you leave them closed up in a dark place, what will they get? Mold. They'll get moldy, so you can't do that. So I, I welcome you to use your N95. When you're done with it and not using it, I welcome you to put it somewhere where it air dries and is exposed to sunlight or, or, or you know, daylights so that you keep the gross stuff that's there all the time from growing in your mask. In my opinion, N95s are good for a shift unless they get grossly wet or dirty. <coughs> with me? Any surgical masks on the patient stay with the patient. Masks may be, in the next couple of weeks, as they are right now in Seattle, used on every patient encounter. Okay? Uh, it may be that we will use them on every patient encounter, no matter what the complaint is. You call for a sprained ankle, you get a mask on the patient. Because in a couple of weeks, we may not trust any of our patient encounters in close proximity, and we may ask the patient to put on a mask just like I do every time I go into a trauma patient room. You know, we completely gown, glove, goggle up to go into trauma patients to protect the trauma patient from the staff and to protect the staff from the trauma patient, okay? It may be the same. So we may do universal respiratory precautions. Some patients may not like that. Who particularly doesn't like that? What age group? <coughs> little ones. And so little ones, you can almost guarantee that mask thing isn't gonna work. If you have a little one with a potential COVID illness, who else is at risk? <coughs> Mom and dad. So you can anticipate putting a mask not on the kid. You will put one on the parent who's going to go with you. Let me, let me speculate about a couple other things I think we'll be doing quickly. I, I think we'll be dealing with the more generalized. It's going to get harder to identify these patients. We are going to approach every patient encounter with one person. We've talked about the six foot thing for how many years in here? One person within the six foot range, no equipment. Everything's kept by their partners, safe distance away. The partners with a mask on, with gloves on, as they were kind of ordinarily would put gloves on. And, um, and they'll have their masks ready to go and they'll have their goggles on. We will try to do patient encounters in what part of the building? Outside. We'll do as many encounters outside as we can in open air circumstances. That's very protective, okay? So that's a couple things I think may change in the coming weeks, all right? Where it's a high risk encounter, N95, and where you are worried that the patient will spew, you then put on gowns or coveralls, okay? So that would be the time to pull, them, pull those out. You don't have to use them for every patient encounter and for low risk patient encounters. And you probably pull them out now if you have somebody who's puke, diarrhea, you know, a mess that you're gonna have to, you know, and you just don't want that gross stuff on your uniform. And so that's the time to pull out the gowns, all right? There are things that we do that create aerosols. Um, what are those things, quickly? I don't have much time to go through and do that. Albuterol treatment is the big one. Intubation is the big one. Uh, CPAP is another one, and administering high-flow dry O2 in a mask is another one. Those are aerosol-generating procedures because they almost demand that the patient coughs. You with me? The cough is what you want to avoid. <laughs> if they're going to cough, you want to be more than six feet away. And if you know that you're going to make them cough for a little bit, like giving them a NEP treatment, you stay away from it for a while. Here's my suggestion. We are going to see patients coming over the next months that are going to be just plain old wheezers, right? 
and if they don't need epi right away if they don't need epi right away they, they need a nebulizer you're going to go into an outside environment not in the back of the medic an outside environment put them on the uh, put them on the nebulizer and excuse yourself explaining to the patient uh, you know how this makes you cough when you do this and that's what we're both kind of worried about so I'm going to back away from you as you do this and then you're going to tell battalion lengthy scene time uh, due to need a patient treatment and you're going to back away for a while while they do their treatment. I do treatments on myself because I've been sick with pneumonia in the last couple months and it makes me cough and the cough actually is when I start to feel better so don't don't not expect it um, and back away from it and don't do it in the back of the medic unit or in a small space. Is that understood? If you have to intubate because you're getting a patient who's in respiratory stress, you got to dress out and I put something on your head too. That that person's going to really cough at you and you're right in their, in their line of business. We need two instruments to evaluate patients. What are they? A Pulse oximeter and a stethoscope. Eyeballs are good in the back of your hand is going to be good. So my sick patient, I'm the one person within six feet. I've got gloves, a mask, and goggles, and she's got a mask on. Here's my assessment. How are you feeling? I've noted respiratory distress. The back of my hand is very good for getting temperatures. And a finger on her pulse. Okay. I need to get an oxygen level on you and see how you're doing. Pulse oximeter on. I wouldn't use the one on the on the life packs or the, uh, the big boxes. I'd use a portable one. And with my stethoscope, I'm going to go around to her back and say, if you if you think that you need to cough, would you let me know and cough in the other direction? I'm going to stay kind of out of your line of shot, and I'm going to listen to her lungs, listening particularly for wheezes. 